Hello, okay, please be seated. So, we are soon going to start. So let's, let's get started. So I'm very happy to chair this first tutorial session. So welcome to ICML 2019, oh, 18, sorry. And we have the pleasure to have like a, a first great tutorial by uh, Yi Song Yu and uh, Ho Wang Lei on imitation learning. So one instruction is if you want to ask questions when the speakers ask uh, you to ask questions, please use the microphones, otherwise nobody will understand and uh, hear you. Thanks a lot, and please welcome uh, Yi Song Yu. All right, thank you everyone. It is really great pleasure to see so many people interested in imitation learning. Uh, my name is Yi Song Yu, I'm a professor at Caltech, and I'll be co-teaching this tutorial with my student Huang Lei, who is a PhD student at Caltech. And by the way, the slides are available online, so if you go to the ICML Tutorials website, and go to the URL for our tutorial website. Uh, you can download the slides and follow along if you'd like. Okay, so imitation learning in a nutshell. So the basic idea is uh, you're given a training set of demonstrations or Oracle access to a demonstrator. And from that training data, our goal is to train a policy to mimic the de demonstrations that were given as training data. So in the example here, we see an example of learning to uh, imitate a uh, human in this race car game. So the human demonstrator is playing this race car game and it gets decomposed into a set of state action pairs where a state is essentially the screenshot of the game. The action in this case is the steering angle of the controller of the game and that gets compiled to a training set and we train a policy to mimic the demonstrations that we've collected. So that's imitation learning in a nutshell. So here are the key ingredients of imitation learning. It varies a little bit, obviously, from application to application, but these are sort of the core ingredients. You start with having the demonstrations or a demonstrator. You often have a simulation environment, or the environment, excuse me, often a simulator, could be the real world, could be something else. You define a policy class you use for training. These days it's often a deep neural net, although it doesn't have to be. You define a loss function, an imitation loss function that characterizes the mismatch between a trajectory that your policy executed in this environment versus an expert demonstration. And finally, you, you use a learning algorithm to uh, optimize for a policy within your policy class within this uh, loss function and this training set. So that's imitation learning in a nutshell. You can think of it as a variant of supervised learning where instead of predicting a single example IID at a time, we're learning to predict a sequence. So in this tutorial, it's gonna be divided into two parts. In the first part, we'll go over some core algorithms and basic settings of imitation learning. It'll be a little bit more technical in terms of the content. And then in the second part, we'll look at various extensions and applications. But first, let me start off with a few teaser results so you can see how imitation learning has been applied already. So arguably the first application of imitation learning happened in the late 80s through the 90s uh, by Dean Parmelo and his colleagues at Carnegie Mellon University in training an autonomous vehicle. So this is one of the first applications. And the basic idea is an autonomous vehicle has been instrumented with sensors, a human is driving this Imitation learning takes over and drives this and steers uh, this vehicle autonomously. Another early application of imitation learning is in helicopter robotics. This was done by uh, Peter Beals and Andrew Wang and his co their collaborators uh, around uh, 10 years ago. And the basic idea here is an uh, expert helicopter drone pilot is piloting, uh, controlling this helicopter drone to do various acrobatic maneuvers. And this data is then collected and a policy is trained to automatically control this helicopter drone to replicate these acrobatic maneuvers. 
Uh, in this example, the uh, robot is navigating a public space and is inferring the intent of the humans in this public space through imitation learning and thus avoiding uh, colliding with the human's uh, uh, predicted trajectory. So on your right, you see more of a top-down view where the cyan box is the robot and the, it's inferring the intention of the human and avoiding collision. Uh, next, we have an application that um, I worked on with collaborators at the Walt Disney Company in animation where we're learning to uh, uh, lip sync uh, a cartoon character in response to audio. Do I look funny to you? I may be a chimp, but I'm dressed better than you. I'm a PhD specializing in computer graphics and facial animation. But at night, I'm a level 10 operative for a secret organization. But we are now on different frequencies. My speech is pretty good, don't you think? Meu português é ainda melhor, não acha? Okay, so in this NISC application, it's an application in sports analytics called ghosting. So what ghosting is, is you take a replay where the defense did not play well, and you overlay on top of this replay what the defenders should have done. And here, uh, the ghosting players are in white, overlaid on top of a replay, and it's being uh, driven by a deep imitation learning algorithm that was trained on professional soccer players. And the last teaser example that I'll give is in one-shot visual imitation learning. Uh, this was done by Rocky Duan uh, and, uh, and their colleagues at Berkeley, where they are basically learning, using imitation learning to uh, train a policy in a family of tasks. And the goal is to train the policy to be able to adapt to any task within this family using only one demonstration. Okay. Now to the boring stuff. Uh, let's talk about, start with some notations. So typically in imitation learning and also in reinforcement learning, which is a closely related topic, we have states and actions. States are the inputs, actions are the outputs or the predictions. Our goal is to train a policy, often parameterized, uh, in this case with theta, uh, a parameter vector, uh, that maps states to actions. If this policy is stochastic, it maps states to distributions over actions. And there's often also a state dynamics as our model, or and this is basically what the simulator or the environment is, which is basically what is the next state given an action applied to the current state. Um, there's a concept known as a rollout, which is basically sequentially executing the policy from some initial state to collect the trajectory of state action pairs. Uh, we could talk about distributions over trajectories, which depend on the randomness of the policy and the randomness of the state dynamics. And we could talk about state distributions as well. Okay, so given that notation, here's how we can think about characterizing some imitation learning settings. So here is, again, the uh, race car setting, which is gonna be one of the drive, uh, running examples in the first half of the tutorial. And so the state here is the game screen, and action is the turning angle of the controller. Uh, we get a training set from the human demonstrator, pi star, of, uh, of a trajectory of state action pairs, and our goal is to learn a policy that maps states to actions in a way that minimizes an imitation loss versus pi star. In another example, in basketball trajectories, uh, this, uh, here let me just explain what the right-hand figure is. Uh, the red lines are the defenders, the green lines are the players on offense, the orange line is the ball, and our goal here is to learn to uh, imitate the behavior of the player in the bolded green line. Right? So the state is the location of all the players in the ball, for simplicity. The action is the next location of the target player in question, which is the player in the bolded green line. We get demonstrations of such tracking data. In this case, it's collected from the National Basketball Association. And the goal is to learn a policy that mimics the behavior of this agent. 
So uh, what are some other data sources one, one can think of when applying a mutation learning? We've already talked about sports and tracking data, games, visual demonstrations. Other things include things like uh, tra trajectory data from vehicles. This is closely related to human intent modeling application that I uh, described a few slides ago. We can do imitation learning from one black box policy that, you tr that was trained in some way and try to train another uh, policy to mimic the behavior of a, of a black box policy. Uh, there are many reasons why you might want to do this, one of them being model compression in a sequential decision making setting. And beyond behavior data, we can also apply imitation learning to other sorts of sequential decision problems, most notably optimization problems. So for example, in your top right corner, you see two optimization problems, one continuous, one discrete, and most optimization solvers are in fact sequential decision making algorithms, and you can actually train a uh, policy to imitate the behavior of such sequential decision making uh, problems and, uh, and algorithms, and we'll see some examples in the second half of the tutorial. Okay, so the, for the remainder of the first half, we're gonna start by looking at the most basic setting of imitation learning known as behavioral cloning. I'll draw a contrast with supervised learning, and then we'll look at, uh, take a more detailed uh, look at the landscape of core imitation learning algorithms. So, behavioral cloning. Behavioral cloning is essentially a very simple and straightforward reduction to supervised learning. So here's how it works. Uh, let P star denote the distribution of states that the expert visits when uh, interacting with this environment. So in the uh, racing car example, it would be the, seek the distribution of uh, basically game screens uh, that are collected when the expert plays this game, right? What behavioral cloning does is it specifies the following learning objective. Given this pre-collected set of demonstrations by the expert, I'm gonna chop it up into state action pairs, treat it each as an IID example, and then apply supervised learning. So given that we're in the current state, my policy should predict an action that minimizes an imitation loss with the correct action. So here the loss function, for example, could be squared error because we're doing regression. So there's a few interpretations of what's going on here. The first interpretation, uh, and, I, and there, there are more than two, of course, so I'm just gonna talk about two, is that assuming perfect imitation so far, so we've, we're, we're only looking at a distribution of inputs where, where we're following an expert perfectly, learn to continue following the expert perfectly. That's one interpretation of what this learning problem is, is trying to learn. A second interpretation is we're trying to minimize the one-step deviation error along the distribution of states experienced by the expert's trajectory. That's a very literal interpretation of what this learning problem is doing. So uh, let's think about behavioral cloning, which is a, you know, learning over a very simplified uh, simplification of general imitation learning versus the more general imitation learning problem. So I, re, uh, I, I, I sort of redisplayed the behavioral cloning learning objective, and the key thing I want you to take away from the comparison is that the distribution of training data is provided exogenously. We query an expert, the expert provides us with a bunch of demonstrations, we treat this demonstration as IID state action pairs, and we train using standard supervised learning. That's behavioral cloning. One variant of a more general imitation learning formulation is shown below, where the key difference now is that the distribution now depends on the policy that we're training. So in particular, if you look at the expectation and compare the expectation of these two objectives, in the first one, the distribution is given to us exogenously. In the second one, the state distribution, it depends on the decision making of our policy that we're training, right? It depends on the theta. And so basically what this means is that in behavior cloning, if we make a mistake, the next state that we get is a soon to be sampled IID from P star. So that's, that's the contrast I'm drawing in the right column in the two, in the two images. Whereas in, in reality what's happening is we start with some distribution over initial states, we give that initial state to our policy, our policy makes a decision, and the next state that's inputted to our policy depends not only on the dynamics and the randomness of the environment, but also on the decision making of our policy. And that breaks the IID assumption. So when might this contrast be problematic if we're using behavior cloning? And let me just give you one uh, 
example that highlights a key limitation of behavior cloning, which uh, can matter a lot and sometimes doesn't matter that much. So imagine that we're in this state and our policy that we train makes a mistake, right? And so we end up being in this state, in the middle, right? Now, we're really close to the edge of the road, and the expert has never done this before. So we don't have a single piece of training data from the expert demonstrations that's pre-collected that has us in this state. Right. What behavioral cloning assumes is, well, you know, uh, my training error is 1% or, or something really small, and I assume that the states are sampled IID from P star, so you know, the next state will be sampled IID from P star. However, the new state here is not sampled from P star. Right. This is the reality. And so, in the worst case, this type of, depending on your application, this type of behavior can be catastrophic. We could quickly visit new states that we've never trained on, and therefore our behavior is undefined, right? And so here's an example. So on the left is a sample of an expert trajectory for this game. So this was the thesis work of Stefan Ross. And on the right, you have behavioral cloning. And eventually, it enters some state that it was, hasn't seen before, and then it crashes. Okay, so I've spent the last few slides bashing behavioral cloning. But of course, uh, it is often uh, something that one should try, and one can use effectively in many applications. So, you know, the. The key advantage of behavioral cloning, and this is one that cannot be emphasized enough, is that it is extremely simple, and there is massive strength and simplicity, right? It's also efficient. It's basically, run, it reduces to one round of supervised learning, which is uh, actually very efficient in, compared to the other imitation learning approaches. The disadvantage is that there's gonna be a distribution mismatch between training and testing, and that may or may not matter. If it matters, it can be pr pretty bad. And in particular, one application where this matters a lot is when your decision-making setting requires some notion of long-term planning. So you should use behavior cloning when one-step deviations are not too costly. Uh, if you're learning reactive behaviors where you can quickly recover and get back onto the distribution of the expert. And when the expert trajectories, in some sense, cover the state space pretty well, right? You should not use behavior cloning when the one-step deviations can potentially lead to catastrophic error and when you're trying to optimize some kind of long-term objective, at least not without a stronger model class. Okay, so now we're gonna uh, continue on with a deep dive into some of the other uh, core algorithms and techniques for imitation learning. So uh, we have behavioral cloning, which I already covered. I'll continue with interactive direct policy learning in interactive direct policy learning, it, it's, it assumes access to an interactive demonstrator that you can query, right? And so what that means is, first we collect some demonstrations from the demonstrator, we apply supervised learning to learn a policy, we roll out that policy in our environment, and then the demonstrator then provides feedback on the rollout trajectories of our learned policy to create more training data that then gets fed back into supervised learning again, the cycle continues until we've converged. And so just one loop of this, reduces the behavioral cloning, and interactive direct policy learning sort of does this until you converge. And then Huang will finish the first half by talking about inverse reinforcement learning, where the idea is to train, uh, uh, was, is to train a reward function, and then apply reinforcement learning as a subroutine to learn a policy to maximize this reward function. And the idea here is that this will work well under the assumption that learning the reward function from demonstrations is in some sense more statistically efficient than directly learning the policy from demonstrations. And this will be touched on in further detail towards the uh, latter half of the first half of the tutorial. And here's just another comparison of the core techniques for imitation learning. Uh, the top row is behavior cloning, then we have interactive direct policy learning, then we have inverse reinforcement learning. So uh, in behavior cloning and interactive direct policy learning, we're directly learning the policy from demonstrations. And you can think of behavior cloning as a special case of interactive direct policy learning. Whereas in inverse reinforcement learning, we're learning the reward function from demonstrations and then indirectly learning the policy by maximizing the reward in a reinforcement learning subroutine. 
Behavioral cloning is quite simple in that it doesn't require access to the environment. We simply take the pre-collected demonstration data and we apply supervised learning. That's it. The other two require access to the environment to roll out a policy and then collect feedback. Uh, only interactive direct policy learning requires an interactive demonstrator to be available during training. The other two, behavior cloning and inverse reinforcement learning, can operate purely on pre-collected demonstrations. So there are a number of other considerations, such as choice of loss functions, what, when the uh, teacher is suboptimal or partial due to size of the state space and action space, uh, domain transfer, structured domains. We'll touch on a number of these issues in the second half of the tutorial. Okay, so now let's talk about interactive direct policy learning, which is a generalization of behavioral cloning. You can think of behavioral cloning as the simplest example, right? So in order to go beyond behavioral cloning within this paradigm, we require access to an interactive demonstrator that is available at, at training time to query. Right? And we analyze interactive uh, direct policy learning typically through the lens of what's known as a learning reduction. What a learning reduction does is it, it reduces a harder learning problem to an easier learning problem, in this case, supervised learning. Um, and there's a general overview of learning reductions uh, available uh, by John Langford. You can follow that link if you're interested. Right. So uh, here's sort of uh, an, uh, how we can think about learning reductions as it relates to behavioral cloning, right? So here's on your left, which I denoted as capital A, we have the more general imitation learning problem. On the right, noted capital B, is the behavioral cloning learning problem. So we've reduced a to B. And the idea of learning reductions is, well, okay, somehow we've developed more methods for B, right? B is a standard IID supervised learning problem. People have looked at generalization error, uh, uh, um, sample complexity, and stuff like that. So if we, if we know that we can learn well on B, does that imply anything about learning well on A? That's what a learning reduction is interested in. So for example, if we have, if we have a PAC guarantee on B, does that imply anything about something like a PAC guarantee on A? And so here are some basic results for behavioral cloning. Uh, I won't go over the proofs and the, the actual results are more, more sophisticated. Uh, you could refer to the two references in the bottom of the slide. So suppose we have a, a loss, imitation loss function where if we match the expert demonstration for a specific state, then the loss is zero. That doesn't always have to be the case, but um, for some, let's assume that's true for here. And now suppose in the behavioral cloning problem, we've trained a policy that achieves error epsilon on the behavioral cloning learning objective, which is on the states induced by the expert, our, train, our prediction error is epsilon. What we can show is that in the more general behavior uh, imitation learning setting, the error is at most capital T times epsilon, where capital T is the time horizon of the decision making. So uh, how many time steps we're rolling out the policy. Um, and the error then on a t-step trajectory is then t-squared epsilon, right? So we do have some guarantees for, for behavior cloning for their general imitation learning setting. They're not great. Okay, now let's talk about direct policy learning. Um, so the basic idea is that we're going to construct a sequence of distributions or a sequence of supervised learning problems, right? And that ideally converges to training the best policy in our policy class for the, for the general imitation learning problem. And we typically start with behavior cloning, which is the uh, bottom bullet point. Uh, now let's talk about how we can use an interactive expert. What an interactive expert is, is basically uh, a human or a computation or an expensive computation oracle that's available at training time to provide feedback on the state distributions induced by the policy that we're training rather than only by the expert, right? What that means is that we can query the expert for any state, essentially. And then we can also have a mechanism for constructing a loss function um, characterizing the mismatch between what our policy is doing versus what the expert would have done on this state for any state. So on the example on the right, uh, you know, uh, as we're steering the car in the racing car game towards the edge of the road, the expert is providing interactive feedback saying, okay, you should steer it more towards the center of the road. That's the red arrow. 
And in, in all the algorithms I'll be describing, they're always applied to the rollout trajectories of the policies that we're training. So we train a policy pi, uh, in, in, in the intermediate policy pi in one round of training. We, uh, we roll out that policy in our environment, we get a sequence of states, and then we ask the expert to tell us what the optimal action would have been to correct for mistakes in any of these states. And as a driving example, if the, if the steering angle is a real valued number, then you know, a, a loss function could be squared error. Okay, so here's uh, one idea, it, and this won't work, but it's sort of the first thing you might think of, right? So we first fix a distribution of states, and then we estimate pi. So this is just behavior cloning if we first just collect demonstrations from the expert, right? And then we fix this pi that we've trained, we execute it in the environment, collect a bunch of states, and use that to be the new state distribution, ask the expert to provide corrections on this state distribution, right? So we can empirically estimate this new p by rolling out pi, and then we repeat. This does not work because it is not guaranteed to converge. We can oscillate, right, between a p, between a p and a pi because we're, we, we've forgotten the earlier mistakes that we've made in this process. So in some sense, we need to keep, we need to remember all the mistakes that we've made uh, in every step of learning. And that leads us to sequential learning reductions. And so this comprises a family of algorithms that have been proposed to solve uh, the setting with different types of guarantees and trade-offs. So we start with an initial predictor, uh, typically the initial expert demonstrations that were provided to us. And uh, we construct a sequence of uh, learning reductions, uh, and this sequence will be indexed by little m. And so we collect trajectories by rolling out pi sub m minus one, the previous uh, policy uh, on the environment, and we estimate the state distribution p sub m using, using these trajectories. And we often roll out multiple times to collect a, a, uh, a large data set. For every state in the trajectories in this rollout, we collect uh, interactive feedback from the expert, what the expert would have done if had the expert entered this particular state. And then it, uh, the details uh, differ a little bit depending on the specific algorithm. So on, on one side, we can do what's called a data aggregation. And what data aggregation does is it trains a single policy, pi sub m, on the union of all the data sets that we, and, and distributions that we've collected so far. Uh, it can get a little more, more <clears throat> excuse me, it can get a little bit more complicated than this, but that's sort of uh, the, the simplest setting. And what this means is that pi sub m is training on all the mistakes that have been made so far during every round of training. Another idea is called policy aggregation. And what policy aggregation does is it trains an intermediate policy, pi prime sub m, on only the current distribution of, mis of states and mistakes. And after it trains pi prime sub m, it blends pi prime sub m with all the previous pi primes, which is the last uh, bullet point on, on this slide. And this blending is geometric. And we obtain our new pi sub m by blending all the pi primes. So that's called policy aggregation. Okay, so data aggregation, uh, the, the core algorithm for data aggregation is called DAGGER, which is short for data aggregation. Uh, the idea, uh, when you think about how to analyze DAGGER, is you, you reduce it to a sequence of convex losses. So imagine that each uh, imitation loss is convex, and we have a sequence indexed by a little m. Uh, DAGGER basically reduces uh, imitation learning to a sequence of online supervised learning problems, and the goal is to find a pi sub m that is competitive with uh, the best policy in our policy class in hindsight. This is known as online regret, for those of you who are not familiar with online learning. And there's a number of online learning algorithms that one can invoke that are called no regret. Uh, one of them is called follow the leader, which basically is the data aggregation algorithm I presented in the previous slide, where you basically find a minimum pi that minimizes all the loss functions you've seen so far, which is basically the union of all the distributions we've seen so far. And this uh, has regret that is sublinear, in capital M, which is the number of rounds of training, which means that we quickly converge to pi sub opt. And 
the implication then is that there exists a policy that we've trained, pi sub m, pi sub little m, that is competitive with pi sub opt. Uh, this is the implication of regret, because if the regret is bounded, that means then the average is bounded, and therefore the minimum is bounded. And so if you can't, didn't follow every detail here, don't worry about it. It's basically in reducing to online learning and, there are no, and, and then invoking any number of online learning algorithms that have good convergence guarantees to basically converge to a good distribution to train a policy that's close to pi sub opt. Okay, uh, policy aggregation uh, basically trains an intermediate policy pi prime sub m on the current distribution of states, pi, uh, p sub m, and then blends it geometrically with all the previous pi primes. So that basically means that pi sub m is this geometric blending of all the previous pi primes. Right. Um, uh, and recall that pi naught is the expert, uh, which is not available at test time. So the way that you think about, the, the way you think about uh, analyzing policy aggregation is analyzing that at each iteration of learning, uh, pi sub m is not that much worse than pi sub m minus one. And in particular, uh, the, it's at most uh, the, the quantity in the uh, purple. And by induction, that means that pi sub capital M, the last policy we train, is not that much worse than pi sub naught, which is the expert, right? So now we've trained a policy that's not that much worse than the expert, and there are ways to uh, cancel out the expert in pi sub capital M because it's negligible, because it, its influence on pi sub capital M decays exponentially. Okay, so just to summarize, and then I'll hand it over to Huang. Uh, what I presented to you is direct policy learning via an interactive expert, which reduces to a sequence of supervised learning problems constructed from rollouts of previously trained policies. And this requires interactive feedback in order to uh, correct for the mistakes made by the policies during intermediate rounds of training. I showed you two approaches, data aggregation and policy aggregation, and, and they have different ways of uh, learning to correct for all the mistakes that have been made in the past to ensure convergence to a policy that's close to optimal. Uh, the, the algorithm, specific algorithms that are derived are motivated by different theoretical foundations. Uh, the data aggregation by reductions to online learning, policy aggregation by one-step deviation uh, types of analyses, which are also common in reinforcement learning. Right. What is not covered is, well, where does the expert feedback come from? What is the loss function? And this will be fairly application dependent, and we'll touch on some of these uh, details uh, more in the second half of the tutorial. So just to uh, summarize, we looked at behavioral cloning, we looked at interactive direct policy learning, which is a generalization of behavioral cloning, and now Huang will talk about inverse reinforcement learning. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Huang Lei from uh, Caltech, and uh, I'll be uh, talking about inverse reinforcement learning. But uh, before we go there, though, uh, a very quick intro to the standard reinforcement learning uh, problem. Now, we often utilize the Markov decision process framework, and an MDP is defined by state space S, action space A, a model P that essentially shows the transition dynamics of the environment, a reward function R, which is typically given, and we may also see a discount factor gamma in between zero and one and a starting state distribu distributions. So this is pretty standard uh, for reinforcement learning. And the goal in reinforcement learning is to find a policy that maximizes the long-term discount of sum of rewards, V, which is referred to as the, uh, the value function. And sometimes we also see, uh, use the action value function Q, which say that if I start in state S and take action A and then follow policy pi afterwards, then uh, what's my expected long-term reward? Now, the key thing here is that when we know all the components of the MDP, we can use dynamic programming techniques such as value iterations or policy iterations to solve for the optimal value functions. And then the optimal policy will flow out from there. Often, though, we don't really know the dynamics model P, but we can interact with the environment. 
And one popular way to learn policy is to use model-free reinforcement learning. And there are many, many methods that exist. I'll just mention one here, where uh, we parameterize our policy by a set of weights theta, such as a neural net. And then we try to optimize for the value function by taking the gradient with respect to theta. The gradient of uh, V with respect to theta is given by the policy gradient theorem. And this is really nice because it's transformed the gradient of V into something that uh, depends on the gradient of the policy and does not depend on the gr uh, gradient of the unknown dynamics. And this is essentially the idea behind the reinforced algorithm. Each time we execute the current policy to get a trajectory, and then we get uh, the estimate for Q function by summing up the rewards that we see along the way until the end of the trajectory. And so this estimate will let us update the policy param uh, parameters theta. This is just a very basic scheme to do reinforcement learning. There are much better methods out there, and if you're interested, uh, you should check out previous tutorials at ICML and, and NIPS from previous years. Okay, so now back to our purpose. First thing to note is that reinforcement learning typically assumes that the reward function is given. And that is fine for setting like video games, for example, where the reward is uh, simply given as part of the, of the game, but in certain settings, it's much less clear uh, what the right reward function should be. Um, so a thought experiment that you can do is imagine trying to write out a, uh, a reward function for good cooking behavior. Uh, then it's not very clear what range of behavior should be in, uh, encouraged. And there are, in fact, many examples of unintended consequence of manually trying to write down the reward functions. Uh, I show here a recent example from uh, OpenAI. So this video show a boat raising task uh, and to encourage the agent to finish the right track, the agent is rewarded for reaching the green targets along the course. But instead of finishing the course, uh, the agent actually learned to cheat the system and get high reward by going around the circle and try to hit as many targets as possible instead of moving forward. So this is one small example of what could happen when you try to uh, incentivize the, the agent to do things that you want. Okay. So we see that in many examples, we don't know what the right reward function should be, and the focus of inverse reinforcement learning is to try to learn uh, the quote-unquote uh, quote optimal reward function. Right? And the data that we learn from is a set of demonstrations similar to the previous imitation learning setting that Yisong described, uh, where each trajectory tau here is just a sequence of state and action pairs. And the goal then is to learn an optimal reward function R star so that we can recover the expert policy pi star. And basically, um, in summary, try to find a reward function that can explain the observed behavior from the expert. So we'll dive into the technical detail of a few algorithms, but here a general recipe for inverse reinforcement learning. We start with some demonstration from the expert. Uh, the expert generally is assumed to be optimal or near optimal. And then we parameterize our reward, uh, unknown reward functions R by theta. And we start out with a simple case where the reward is a uh, linear function of uh, known features. And then often, you know, we, we would re update the reward parameters in a loop. Uh, and given a reward function estimate, we then try to learn a policy uh, condition on that reward functions. And then we would compare the policy that we learned with the expert data. And so if it's not satisfactory, then we would repeat to find a better set of parameters, data, and, and so on. Okay, so that's the overall uh, structure. But as with many inverse problems, inverse reinforcement learning is fundamentally ill posed. So let's take this example of the agent uh, here in the white dot trying to uh, navigate the maze from the bottom left corner to the yellow uh, goal block. Now, uh, given just this demonstration, we can't really tell what the reward function may be if the agent happened to bump into one of the red blocks, say. So in this case, you can see that a small punishment or a very large punishment uh, would actually correspond to the same exact behavior. And so, more generally, uncovering the optimal reward function is ambiguous. 
So one thing that we can do to relax, uh, to, is to relax the original uh, IRL formulation. So in a paper by and uh, Peter Abio and Andrew Ng in 2004, instead of trying to uncover the optimal R star and pi star, they actually relax the goal somewhat to say that as long as I can find a reward function so that the performance of the optimal policy with respect to that reward is not much worse than the performance of the true expert performance, then I'm happy. And note that this is a little bit different from the original inverse reinforcement learning uh, in, in, in the sense that we're not insisting on looking for the true reward function here. Uh, another relaxation suggested by Syed and Shapira in 2007 is a game theoretic formulation uh, to the inverse reinforcement learning problem. And the goal here is to find a policy that performs better than the expert over a, a restricted class of reward function. Uh, the imitation learning problem here is formulated as a two-player game. Uh, on one hand, the reward player tries to find the best possible reward in the class. And at the same time, the policy player tries to push the uh, performance difference between the policy and the expert as far apart, uh, apart as possible. So in both cases, though, we are operating, un, uh, operating under some uh, friendly assumption. And uh, we are restricting ourselves, first of all, to fully knowing the dynamics model P up front. And when the model is supposed to be given, I will just generically refer to it as model given. Uh, the reason is I want to avoid the term model based because that means something uh, else in reinforcement learning. Uh, we also um, assume access to some oracle that given any reward function can solve the MDP efficiently. And usually that means that we have small enough of a state space uh, so that this can be done uh, efficiently. And importantly, the reward function we're interested in for now is linear in the known, known features of state and actions. Uh, the class of reward functions uh, that is uh, covered in Syed and Shapiri in 2007 is those with L1 norm exactly equal to one and the class of reward function considered under Abio and Ng is the with L2 norm less than or equal to one. Okay, so now let's see how this linear reward function assumption would help us. We can rewrite the value function of any policy pi in terms of this new uh, reward definition. And now you can essentially pull out the theta outside of the expectation and leaving a term, a, a term that only depends on the feature of the state that the policy visit, uh, phi st. And uh, we would group this term together and we call these remaining terms uh, mu pi, the feature expectations of the policy pi. So intuitively, mu pi, another way I could put it is that it is the average of visited state features given a policy. And it's easy to see that if the re reward is linear, then finding a policy that matches the expert features imply that the policy is optimal. And this is true regardless of any uh, theta. Expressing value function uh, this way in terms of the feature expectation turned out to be very convenient because we're reducing the inverse reinforcement learning problem into a problem of feature matching, essentially. Now, of course, this is somewhat idealized. Right, because in practice, we can really estimate this quantity mu star, uh, mu pi star, exactly, because we only have limited number of uh, demonstrations. So in a way, this problem is also ill posed, similar to original inverse reinforcement learning problem. And so we need to apply some restriction. Now, one such restriction from Abio and Ng is that we relax the problem to become finding a policy pi so that the feature expectations of pi and pi star differ by no more than some epsilon. And to see why this is good enough, here's a short proof using essentially Cauchy Swatch inequality. And because we're limiting the set of reward parameters to one with L2 norm less than one, so as long as we find a policy who expected feature close to the experts, then the performance of that policy will be guaranteed to be close to the expert policy as well. And so here's the uh, algorithm sketch. Uh, for each iteration, we solve a max margin problem. Uh, this optimizations basically try to find the max margin of the expert feature uh, 
uh, from all the feature, the policy that we have found uh, so far up to this round. And every time we saw this optimization, we got a new reward estimate. So if we refer back to the diagram that we have before, uh, this is only the, uh, the update reward step. Now, of course, uh, we have those assumptions, so let's use them using the, the MDP solver oracle. We can get an optimal pol policy with this, uh, with respect to this reward estimate. And because we know the dynamics model, we can compute the features of the, um, of the expectation of this new policy, and then we can compare that with the expert and so forth. And the algorithm would stop when the margin found is less than some desired precision epsilon. And in the paper, the authors proved that the algorithms need at most this many uh, iterations, where k is a dimension of the state feature and gamma is a discount factor of the, of the MDP. Okay, so this max margin approach was also used in the paper Maximum Margin Planning by Ratliff et al. in 2006, um, where the authors actually attempt to generalize this setting to multiple MDPs. And I also previously touched on the game theoretic formulation from Syed and Shapira, and the overall scheme is actually similar, except that the reward parameters are updated using multiplicative update weight, uh, weight update algorithms, excuse me, instead of solving a quadratic program as we saw earlier. And the, the common theme of these work is that they share the same features of relaxing the inverse reinforcement learning problem to one uh, to one of feature expectation matching. And just a quick recap, the idea is that we find a reward so that the optimal policy with respect to this reward matches the, uh, the expert feature. And since looking for this reward is ill-posed, so we are restricting our reward search to solve for, to resolve this ambiguity. And this effectively can be viewed as a form of regularization. And now I'd like to discuss another regularization scheme, which is maximum entropy. So to motivate the maximum entropy method, uh, let's recall that we talk about how, given the same expert demonstration, many reward functions could correspond to the same policy. Uh, so we sidestep this problem in a way, and we say, okay, feature matching will give us a near optimal policy anyway. But think about the eventual goal. Right? If we want to find a policy that could explain the expert behavior, then we could basically create any two policy that match the expert feature, and we can create any stochastic combinations of them. And the resulting policy will also satisfy the feature matching requirement. So in a way, we still have the ambiguity of deciding which one is the right policy. And maximum entropy principle gives us actually a principal way to resolve this issue. Uh, first, uh, we notice that executing any policy pi over the state space will induce a distributions over possible trajectories. Uh, let's call the, that uh, p tau. And we'll now will reason over the distribution of these trajectories. First, we can rewrite the feature expectation matching requirement that we saw before as simply summing over all possible trajectories induced by pi. Uh, two things is that one, the sum should match the expert feature, right? And uh, second, it should sum up to one to be a proper distribution. So now, given this constraint, among possible distributions of trajectory that satisfy these, which one should we choose? And the maximum entropy principle, uh, as discussed by James in 1957, state that we should choose one that, uh, with the, the largest entropy. And to state it another way, we should uh, pick one that explain the data uh, without overcommitting. So we could essentially express this principle as a constraint optimization problem, where the first constraint here in practice is just an empirical average of the expert feature coming from the demonstrations, right? Because we don't have access to true expert feature uh, mu star. Okay, so from here we could, could turn this constraint optimization problem into an unconstrained one by forming the Lagrangian, it's pretty standard technique in optimization, and trying to maximize this Lagrangian. Uh, we, uh, you know, we, we're gonna set the gradient with respect to tau to, to zero, and after some derivation, we will see that 
the distribution that maximizes the entropy, given the linear feature matching constraint, is actually in the exponential family. And in particular, if the reward is linear in the known feature, uh, as we discussed before, then the max entropy distribution of trajectories, given the reward parameters theta, will depend exponentially on the inner product of theta and the feature of trajectory tau. So going back to the inverse reinforcement learning setting, what does this mean to, uh, for us? It means that the probability of a trajectory with high reward is exponentially more likely to be sampled from an expert than trajectory with low reward. And basically, this is the formulation behind uh, the paper Maximum Entropy Inverse Reinforcement Learning by Zbart in 2008. Uh, so given a reward parameters theta, the conditional probability of trajectory will take this exponential form uh, divided by the uh, partition function, which is sum over all possible uh, trajectory, which actually seems kind of tough. But as we'll see uh, for now, a, in a model given context and a small MDP, we don't really have to worry about it so much, uh, about this uh, partition function for now. Uh, but uh, the, 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 our goal is how, okay, how, how do we learn the reward function given this, this formulation? And we're gonna, we're gonna learn the reward function by maximizing the log likelihood of the observed data under the distributions derived here. So taking the log likelihood breaks the product into the sum of conditional probability of each expert trajectory given the parameters theta. And we're gonna use gradient descent over uh, this objective to maximize the likelihood. In particular, in this case, uh, since we know the model and the reward is linear, the gradient can actually be expressed in this closed form. Um, the first component is just the empirical estimate of the feature expectation of the expert, which we can calculate easily. The second component is actually trickier. Uh, it's a sum over all states and depends on the state visitation frequency d sub s under the current policy. And the author suggests that we can use, um, we can use dynamic programming to efficiently calculate this visitation frequency measure. And concretely, at times t plus one, the state visitation frequency depends on those from times t and also depends on the current policy pi and the transition dynamics from s to s prime which is supposed to be uh, known because we are given the model. And again, here pi theta comes from an MDP solver that gives us the optimal policy with respect to the current theta. So basically, uh, this is how we are updating the reward parameters in max entropy inverse reinforcement learning. And so far, uh, yeah. we focus, you know, here's a good place to summarize the inverse reinforcement learning technique so far. So far we focus on pretty simple setting. Uh, we assume that the reward is linear in some known feature. And for each iteration, we actually need to solve a full reinforcement learning problem. Uh, and this requires essentially to know the dynamics of the MDP upfront, which is not always realistic. And it really only works for low dimensional setting because solving RL uh, in the inner loop can be uh, very expensive. So now let's discuss generalized setting where we don't know both the reward and the dynamics. Can we consider complex reward function that can be represented by a neural network? Uh, we will assume that we have access not to the full dynamics but access to interacting with the environment or a simulator and we'll try to scale up to a large state space. And this is where we're gonna go next. Okay, so one generalization is the guided cost learning algorithm by Finn et al. in uh, ICML 16. Here, the reward function is parameterized by a neural network. And we're going to start from the same maximum entropy formulation as before. And except for now that, as you will see, the partition function is gonna be an issue. But in any case, we will still try to learn theta via uh, maximum likelihood. But except now that we can simply break up the gradient in terms of the state features anymore because the cost is no, is, is no longer linear. Instead, now we, we have uh, to undress the partition functions Z here uh, 
which again will sum over all possible trajectories. And calculating z in general is not uh, tractable in high dimensional setting. So we need to sample to evaluate the likelihood um, and uh, its gradient. Uh, and you know, after we can estimate the gradient of the likelihood, then we're gonna be able to update the parameters theta. So that's gonna be our goal. Okay, but the key idea in approximating z is to sample from a proposal distributions Q over some trajectory. And then we're gonna form unbiased estimate of z by uh, averaging over this sampling distribution with the exponential reward weighted by the proposal uh, probability. And this estimate of z, as we discussed, will allow us to estimate the gradient of the likelihood for optimizing the reward function, right? But the question still remains, which proposal distribution should we choose? So it turns out uh, we can uh, derive this. The optimal of such proposal distribution actually is the distributions induced by the optimal policy, which we don't know, right? So this requires doing policy optimization. But ideally, we would like to avoid doing a full uh, reinforcement learning routine. And uh, just for your reference later, I include the derivation of the estimate of the gradient here. Uh, you can go back and to see it uh, if you're interested. So this is a high-level overview of the guided cost learning algorithm. For each loop, say we have a current policy, we would generate sampling distributions, which are a set of trajectories not far away from the ones induced by the current policy. And these sampling trajectories are then combined with existing expert demonstrations, and we can use them to estimate the gradient of log likelihood to update the reward parameters. And then using this uh, estimated reward, instead of solving the full reinforcement learning problem, we are just going to do one gradient step uh, of model free policy optimization. And this improved policy will in turn presumably generate better sampling distributions for subsequent iteration. So there's an analogous connection here between this update loop and generative adversarial network where the, the policy is playing the role of a generator, trying to generate samples similar to the expert demonstrations, and the reward function is, is playing the role of a discriminator, trying to assign high reward to expert trajectories and low reward to the policy induced by the learning policy. And this connection between imitation learning and uh, generative adversarial network was the focus of a paper, Generative Adversarial Imitation Learning by Ho and Amon in NIPS 16. So in the next few minutes, I'm gonna derive this connection, but from the feature matching perspective. So let's go back to 2008. Syed and others proposed an approach to do direct imitation learning. Uh, back then, they also called it apprenticeship learning via matching occupancy measure. So occupancy measure d pi intuitively is a visitation frequency of state action pair S and A if we follow the policy pi. And this is a more formal definition of dpi. Uh, by the way, we can think of, uh, of this as feature expectation of, of pi, where the feature vector is to indicate a, fun indicate a function instead of phi. And uh, a simple fact about occupancy measure is dpi is that we can express the value function v as a linear combination of reward function over possible state and actions. And notice that this is actually true regardless of whether reward function is linear or not. So then, similar to the idea behind feature expectation matching, the imitation learning problem now can be reduced to one of occupancy matching. Now, we're not saying that we have to find the optimal reward. Rather, we're saying that if, if we can match the occupancy measure with the expert, then for any reward function, including the optimal one, the value functions will match that of the optimal policy. And so from here, Syed and others propose to solve a linear program, which is the dual of the original MDP. And two, two uh, things to note here. First is that uh, uh, actually in their algorithm, there is no reward learning. Uh, so under this scheme, we don't really need to solve the full reinforcement learning problem iteratively. And the second thing is that we can think of this occupancy matching problem as a dual of the original MVP problem. 
So generally, though, the occupancy matching problem is not well posed, similar to the matching of the feature expectations that we saw uh, a few slides ago. So we can once again try to employ maximum entropy principle and consider this relaxed version where we're going to maximize the entropy subject, subject to the occupancy measure, d, uh, d pi and d star being closed under some sort of distant metric. And this gives us a constraint optimization problem. And again, forming the Lagrangian and turning this into an unconstrained optimization problem, we arrive at this highlighted objective and know that in general there are many uh, ways for us to pick the distant metric between d pi and d star. And so now we arrive at the formulations, which is the great starting point for generative adversarial learning, uh, I'm sorry, uh, generative adversarial imitation learning, or Gale, from uh, Ho and Ermon in 16. In particular, the distant function that they consider took this form, which is also referred to as the Jensen-Shannon divergence. And so this is the final optimization objective of Gale. There's a close connection between imitation learning and generative adversarial network here, where the idea is we can pick a neural network to be a discriminator, um, which is uh, D here. The discriminator tries to classify a sample from the expert as zero and the sample coming from the policy as one. And we can train the discriminator by updating the network weight by applying this gradient. And basically, this discriminator tries to maximally tease apart the expert and the policy uh, trajectories. And the policy, on the other hand, is acting like a generator that tries to generate samples as similar to the expert demonstrations as possible, right? We are assuming here that uh, we have access to the, to the environment or a simulator of the environment and the generator can improve its ability uh, to output realistic sample, essentially, by taking a policy optimization step as well, similar to the guided cost learning algorithm. Uh, so the overall architecture of the two algorithms actually have uh, share uh, high level similarity, but the way that we derive uh, it here is more direct. And so with this, I want to summarize uh, uh, the uh, different approaches under inverse reinforcement learning. And so far, we have discussed an evolution of different inverse reinforcement learning idea. Uh, we have start from, we started from simpler setting where, and we work up to a more complex setting, uh, complex model free setting. In either case, the schematic of the inverse reinforcement learning uh, solution is generally an iterative three-step process where in each iteration, we're gonna update our reward estimate, whether linear or neural net representation. We go from solving a full reinforcement learning problem in each iteration, which basically limit us to small MDP, to doing single step uh, reinforcement learning update. And essentially that allows us to work with continuous state space MDP. Uh, this fast reinforcement learning update is possible also thanks to all the advances of uh, stochastic optimizations, particularly with uh, deep neural network. And we go from simpler setting where dynamics is supposed to be known, uh, which allow us to compare policy performance uh, of the expert, uh, with the expert easily, to the model free case where it's trickier, but we replace the requirement of knowing the dynamics with an access to environment or simulator to gather more data. And essentially, uh, we unify these two perspectives using uh, occupancy measure and the maximum entropy principle. So here's a list of the papers that we have covered in the first half of the tutorial. Now uh, we are happy to answer any uh, questions that you may have. So uh, if if there are questions, we're happy to answer. Otherwise, we'll re we start the second half of the tutorial at uh, 10.30 a.m. Is there a microphone? Yeah, there are microphones. Yeah. I have a question. Oh. Yep. Hello. Yeah, so um, I was wondering, Dagger versus uh, CERN. So what were your thoughts in terms of their properties? <laughs> 
Well, since uh, if you look at the analysis of Dagger versus CERN, uh, learning reductions, the analysis is always relative to the strength of the policy class. And so the reductions, in some sense, you, cannot, you can't say anything super conclusive because uh, it could be that uh, the way you do the reduction in CERN leads you to an easier supervised learning problem than you, do in, than you get in Dagger. Um, so assuming that the supervised learning reduction gives you the same efficiency, which you cannot say until you actually run it on the application, then Dagger is more efficient. Hi. Um, I was wondering if for the imitation, the like behavior imitation, is the performance, like for example in the racing game, strictly constrained by the performance of the expert so in all the applications and uh, settings we looked at, the performance is constrained by the strength of the expert. Hi. Can you hear me? I'm here. So in the first thing, which was the behavior matching or behavior, I don't know what you called it. Cloning. Uh, you said that the problem is that um, all the states are sampled from the demonstration, therefore the actual policy might wander into a region which it hasn't seen in a demonstration. That also seemed to be a problem for the Maxent method because it also just, uh, the, the likelihood you actually sample from the real data and real trajectories. Uh, do you also see that a problem with the Maxent method? I would say that it's a little bit different. So the first part of your questions, the way that I would address that is, Behavior cloning, you run into problem, particularly when you run into setting where you have partial observability, where your contextual features that not does not really capture the full state information. And so therefore, learning policy directly, uh, as you saw discussed in the first half of the tutorial, is actually tricky. Now, max entropy method is a little bit different because you're trying to capture the cost information. And so in a way, it run into a different set of problems where uh, even if I have the full set information, the reward learning problem is still not very well posed. So max entropy actually is a way to help you regularize that, regardless of whether you have full observability or partial observability, if that makes sense. So yes, uh, in a way it is a problem, but it's, it's a different problem, if, if that makes sense. Hey, I have a question here. So for the racing game, you were using for testing, for experiment. So for the input, for state, do you do any pre-processing for the graphic or you just using the raw pixel? Uh, so that's a fairly application specific question. Um, certainly if you are using modern methods such as based on convolutional neural networks, the amount of pre-processing of the pixels is necessary is fairly minimal these days. Mm -hmm. In the earlier work where they largely relied on linear functions, then there was a lot of uh, pre-processing of the pixels. Okay. Another question is uh, how do you collect the input? I mean, you have a, like a, you, you keep or you have another uh, process or a pr program to connect the, the user inputs? Yeah, you're just key logging all the inputs of the game, game yeah. controller. Um, yeah, because I mean, is there any kind of like delay? Because when you like you when you like turn left or turn right, there. I, mean, I don't know if the human input has any delay, and is there any kind of like, um, effect on the algorithm? You want to answer that one? Yeah. Um, so in certain applications, it, it is actually an issue. Um, I suppose that for the example of the racing game that was discussed in the first half. And that's a lot less of an issue. But in the second half, we're going to discuss one particular application where you, the learning agent tried to gather human feedback. Mm -hmm. And because of the speed that the human can give feedback, it's actually a lot uh, slower than what the com uh, computer can handle. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to have to try to accumulate the human feedback in a certain way. But yes, it, 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 it could be a problem. OK. OK. I'm looking forward to the second part. So 
one of the core difficulties mentioned was that there are multiple reward functions that can explain the expert behavior. So do you think that Bayesian methods could be used here, for example, to learn a posterior over the reward function parameters? Um, yes, I think so. But I mean, I guess under Bayesian methods, the way that you use a prior is basically is equivalent to some form of regularization as well, where you're encoding your prior information into it. So it's another form of restricting your reward uh, inference, if that makes sense. Uh, it's similar to the previous two methods that we discussed, where you're going to try to restrict your reward for parameters to have L1 norm equal to 1, for example. Right? Right. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, about the last part of the presentation, where, uh, where you talked about uh, the similarities between imitation learning and uh, GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. Yes. How tightly are these coupled now based on those results? And does it mean that everything that's happening in GANs to stabilize them and all research is directly applicable to this problem of imitation learning as well? Um, well, so the answer to that question is the formulation of GAN or the paper that introduced Gale that I discussed previously uh, did have some problems with some some extension or depending on the application. So in particular, in the second half, we're going to talk about one applications where uh, the expert trying to demonstrate the kind of trajectory that have multiple different modes. So as you may know, GAN faces problem of mode collapsing. Yeah. So using Gale for that purpose faced the problem. And there was actually a follow-up paper that tried to address that issue. Um, this is on the assumption of a linear reward function. So how good is this at approximating, say, like nonlinear reward functions? So how does it perform with different types of reward functions of nonlinear forms? I, um, so to really answer, so answering these questions fully is actually is tricky because, so one thing that I would point out is that the reward function in this setting, in the simpler setting, mm -hmm. It's assumed to be linear in known feature, right? Oh, yeah, linear in features, yeah. Right, so they never oh, really yeah, talk yeah. about what those features could be. Now, in uh, principle, you could have some very expressive feature, right? And, and that could be very good. Right. Or you can have very, very bad features, and it's not going to get you anywhere. Right. So it really depends. Right, so it's actually much more general than it appears then, since that's, the features can be very That's expressive. right. The only thing that makes it, you know, less general, I guess one of the things that make it less general is that these features in g are supposed to be known up front. Oh, okay, okay. Right? So if you have a neural network, right. then you have a lot more flexibility in terms of choosing these features. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
Almost the same. Okay, we'll be starting soon. All right, welcome back to the second half of the tutorial. Uh, in the second half, we'll be looking at various extensions and applications of imitation learning to a wide range of settings. Uh, we're gonna start with one of my personal favorites in speech animation. I gave you a uh, teaser result uh, in the very beginning of the tutorial. And I'm gonna just spend a couple of minutes telling you a little bit more of the details. And so here is the uh, high-level idea. The, the, it's from a paper titled The Deep Learning Approach to Generalized Speech Animation. It was a project I worked on in collaboration with the Walt Disney Company. And so here's the idea. Uh, we have an input sequence. Here we'll use X, which you can think of as an input sequence of phonetics. And then we have an output sequence. Uh, here we're gonna use Y, which in this case is an output sequence of deformations of a face model. So Y, each token in the sequence Y, is d-dimensional, and you see on the right an illustration of how one can collect such data. So here is an actor, he is speaking sentences, and we're watching this actor's mouth move as that person is speaking sentences, and we built a mouth model that is, uh, in this case, has 30 degrees of freedom. So d equals 30. And the goal then is to learn a predictor pi that maps from sequence of x to sequences of y. And so you see uh, in the bottom part in a, um, a example, so X here is a frame by frame decomposition of uh, a phonetic decomposition, excuse me, of the word prediction. And here the temporal resolution is 30 hertz. And in the very bottom, we're visualizing the first dimension of a D dimensional, a 30 dimensional face model. And the first dimension corresponds to how wide open the mouth is. So when the first dimension is large, the mouth is wide open. When the first dimension is small, the mouth is closed. So as we start saying the word prediction, the mouth sharply opens and then stays open, and then closes a little bit, stays at that level of openness, and then closes some more. So this is the prediction problem. And without going into the details of the learning algorithm, uh, we're basically doing behavior cloning. So um, with, a few t with a few little tweaks that we don't need to go into details, just basically the behavior cloning method that you saw in the first half. And you get results that look like this. Um, note that since we're mapping phonetics to animation, uh, we in some sense are language independent as long as you plug and play with the correct speech recognition software. Deutsche Wörter sind sehr viel länger als englische Wörter. Mal sehen, ob das trotzdem funktioniert. Jeśli kiedykolwiek będziesz odwiedzał Polskę, polecam Kraków. Mama Dalda Maliga Wandimata Senesurada Hause Gemi. Niemand Jen Taoyan. Chirbala, Hozula, Jotona Kawa Shoha. So that was me speaking Chinese. Uh, we can do singing. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. 
from glen to glen and down the mountainside. And so just to give you a glimpse of how uh, this project came into being, it was, uh, it was designed and originally motivated to fit into a production pipeline, such as those you would see at uh, animation companies, such as at Walt Disney Animation. So you have your input audio. Uh, you use off-the-shelf speech recognition. You get the phonetics, and you feed that into the model that we trained, the predictor that we trained. And then you can use standard computer graphics techniques to retarget from our face, intermediate face representation to any uh, animated character. And then you import that animation to editing tools such as Maya, and then the, uh, and then the animation artist can inject uh, low frequency edits such as smiling on top of the high frequency animation of the lip syncing, which is at 30 hertz. And so that's basically how it works. Next, I'm gonna move on to imitation learning for structured prediction and learning to search. So structured prediction, uh, the idea is to learn a mapping from some structured input space X to some structured output space Y, right? And typically, uh, because the output space is structured and is often combinatorially large, this requires solving an optimization problem at prediction time. Uh, perhaps the most common example is the Viterbi algorithm for running map inference of hidden Markov models, where the structured output space is uh, the space of all possible sequential outputs. And so there are many, many instances of structured prediction. And in fact, uh, arguably the vast majority of prediction problems that we actually are interested in in the, in the real world are structured prediction problems. We just often don't treat them as such. So other examples include TAS and NLP. Uh, so if X is a sentence, Y can not only be just a sequence, like a part of speech tag sequence, but also can be an entire parse tree. So the output space is the space of all possible parse trees, which is combinatorially large. If X is a body of text and Y is a clustering of all the noun, noun entities, named entities in that, uh, in that text um, for what's called noun phrase co-reference clustering. If X is an, an amino acid sequence, we want to predict, in, for example, uh, in Y, the 3D structure of X, right? These are all examples of structured output spaces. Other examples include, uh, this is a classic example in computer vision, which is stereo vision. X is a pair of binocular um, images, and Y is the depth map. And the structure here arises from the fact that we want to model spatial correlations. So the depth of two neighboring pixels should be uh, similar to each other, all other things being equal. We can uh, predict things like rankings, which are very common in applications in information retrieval and recommender systems. And the space of all possible rankings is also combinatorially large. Uh, robotic trajectory planning, routing, routing is a structure prediction problem, and things like conservation planning where you want to uh, do uh, planning for conservation areas in an urban environment, satisfying constraints such as the fact that they're all connected and other sorts of uh, ecological constraints as well. So these are all just a few examples of the many, many, many types of structure prediction problems in the world today. And so let's sort of get into a little bit more of a, the technical details with the simplest version of structure prediction, which is sequence labeling. And uh, the example, the most common example here is part of speech tagging. It's also quite common in various uh, computational biology applications as well. So in part of speech tagging, which is uh, an NLP application, uh, we're given a sequence of words, X, and we want to predict a sequence of part of speech tags, Y. A part of speech tag are things like a noun, verb, adverb, adjective, determiner, et cetera. And so because this part, the, sequ the, all uh, the space of all possible sequences is exponentially large, we typically use some sort of optimization procedure. In this case, we're gonna use dynamic programming, such as the Viterbi algorithm. And the goal then is to find a parameterization of the cost function before we run dynamic programming, such that we minimize a global loss function over strings. In this case, let's just say it's Hamming loss. Okay, so. When we phrase this as an imitation learning problem, uh, the, the, the most common way is to learn the decision function, right? So our goal is to use imitation learning to learn the sequential decision function that actually solves this optimization problem at test time, right? So here's, here's an example of how that might work, right? So uh, we have our policy pi that's gonna sequentially predict all the output tokens of this part of speech tag problem. Um, so uh, the action is basically a predicting a, an output token. And so let's start with the first state, which is basically in this case represented as the concatenation of the input sentence X and the fact that we haven't predicted anything yet. 
that gets fed into the policy. The policy predicts a part of speech tag. The next state is the concatenation of our input sentence with the fact that we predict a determiner in the first token. We feed that into our policy. Our policy predicts the next part of speech tag. And this process continues. And so the goal then is to learn this pi, right? If we can learn this pi, then we can learn to use it for this particular structure prediction problem. And uh, throughout this part of uh, the tutorial in structure prediction, we're gonna look at it from the viewpoint of interactive feedback, uh, or in other words, interactive direct policy learning. Okay, so let's run through how this might work using Dagger, which is one of the uh, direct, interactive direct policy learning algorithms that we talked about in the first half of the tutorial. You could use other ones as well. Uh, this is just for simply for simplicity. So in iteration one, we've memorized the uh, training labels. In this case, the, the ground truth sequence labels. So that's pi naught. So we roll out pi naught. And what that means is we have our first state, which is the input sentence, plus the fact that we haven't predicted anything yet, and pi naught predicts the terminer in the first part of speech tag because it always predicts the correct answer. The second state is x concatenated with the fact that we predicted the terminer in the first part of speech tag, and then pi naught predicts noun uh, because it always predicts the correct answer, and this process continues, right? What Dagger does is then it collects interactive feedback. Here, interactive feedback is collected by querying the collection of supervised labels from the structure prediction problem. So we have all the correct part of speech tags. That's the action. That gets, com that gets treated as the trajectories to estimate our distribution of state action pairs from the rollout, rolling out pi naught. And then we train a policy, pi one, on p1, or in this case, an empirical estimate of p1. In iteration two, we run the, our train policy pi one on our, on our uh, uh, input instances. And here, we make a mistake, right? So in our first state, it's the same as before, but our policy pi one uh, predicted noun in the first part of speech tag instead of determiner, which is the correct answer. Now, the second state is a state that we've never seen before, right? In the, in, the, in the initial training data because, it, because the initial rollouts are based off always making the correct prediction. So now the second state is the, uh, the input sentence x and the fact that we predicted noun in the first part of speech tag, and so on and so forth. So we roll out pi one. We again collect the correct labels by querying uh, the structured labels that, we, that are given to us for training. And so we're basically learning in the, second, in the second state to correctly predict noun even though we incorrectly predicted noun in the first part of speech tag. So we were learning to recover from having made a mistake. And that gets constructed into a second training set or an empirical estimate of a second training set, P2. And we train pi two on the union of P1 and P2. This is dagger. If you were doing CERN, we would train a different policy on each one and stochastically mix them. And this process continues, now we roll out pi two. Pi two now corrects, predicts the terminal correctly in, in the uh, first set, in the first state. And then it makes, for whatever reason, it makes, it makes a mistake in the second state and it predicts verb instead of noun. And then we, now we collect a training set that can learn to recover from making a mistake in state S3. And we train pi three on the union of pi one, pi two, and pi three. And this process continues until we've converged. So that's basically how you would apply interactive direct policy learning to structure prediction problems. So here are the basic ingredients. Uh, the, the key idea is that we want to deal with distributional shift. The distributional shift in this case is basically whenever the, the policy makes a mistake, we need to learn to recover from the mistakes in, while we're doing inference in the structure prediction problem. Uh, this is related to other uh, approaches that have been proposed recently, such as scheduled sampling. Another issue, and I'll touch on this more in, a, in a, just a little bit, is that you want to design the imitation loss in the reduction to be compatible with the high level, with the original structure prediction loss. In the example that I just gave you, the structure prediction loss was Hamming loss. Now, Hamming loss is particularly easy to deal with because it's completely additive. It completely decomposes additively 
uh, per token in the sequence. And so one could just construct zero one classification loss on the multi-class labels at each step in the decision making of the sequence labeling. And, and you can show that doing that well lifts to doing well on Hamming loss because Hamming loss is trivially additive. More generally, we need to reduce to uh, cost sensitive classification. And there are also efficiency considerations such as running this, uh, all these uh, uh, different modules quickly and in some cases doing it in a fully differentiable way to take advantage of recent advances in training deep neural nets. And so I'm not gonna, now I'm gonna give you just a, a, a little bit of detail on one example where we actually have to reduce to a cost sensitive classification error because the original loss function was not a trivially additive, right? And this is uh, a paper called Learning Policies for Contextual Somodular Optimization. And the basic idea is as follows. We have a training set of context, comma, somodular functions. So uh, X is the context, and F sub X is a somodular function, monotone somodular function associated with that context. And the goal is to learn a pi uh, that greedily or sequentially maps X to an action set A uh, to maximize f sub x. So for those of you who don't know, so modular functions are set functions that map sets to real values. And typically in the maximization setting, one, needs to, one wants to select a budgeted subset of the ground set of actions that maximizes uh, f sub x. And the greedy algorithm, which sequentially grows uh, the this, this set, is sort of the most widely accepted way of doing so. But now we want to learn a policy that does this without, ha without having to actually query f sub x. And so here's the learning reduction, right? So at each state, we have, uh, um, is described by x comma a, where a is the set of already selected actions. And now we need to create a training example from this state in order to train the policy to mimic the greedy algorithm uh, as well as possible. And how we do so is first we define an f sub, f sub max, which is the max possible incremental gain in the submodular function from adding any action to the action set. And then we construct a cost function, which is not zero one loss, but depends on wh what I call the greedy samaj of regret, which is the difference between the samaj gain of taking any particular action versus the maximum possible samaj gain. And now we construct a supervised training example of that input state plus this cost vector of overall possible actions, and that is fed into a supervised learning algorithm. And then you could wrap dagger or CERN around this approach, and you can now show that minimizing this cost sensitive supervised learning error in the reduction will lead to a near optimal policy in your policy class overall. Okay, so another perspective on structure prediction is that it is similar to, or in many cases, equivalent to some kind of learning to search problem, right? So what is learning to search? Well. Learning to search basically says we have some input description, x, and we compile it into a search problem, a combinatorial search problem typically, right? And we then want to train a policy pi to effectively or efficiently navigate this search space, right? And there's a few different considerations. Uh, you know, there's some high level supervised reward or cost function that we're trying to maximize or minimize, such as routing costs, the blue score if you're doing translation, Hamming loss, Samadhi utility, Jacquard score, et cetera, et cetera. And we want to train a policy that, you know, in this case, reduces to a set of supervised learning problems whose where the supervised learning error guarantees lift back up to doing well on the original high-level reward or cost. Another issue that comes up here, which is something I touched on very briefly in the first half of the tutorial, is that the expert here might be weak, right? So even though the, this problem is fully supervised, in many structure prediction settings, computing the optimal solution uh, can be uh, combinatorially hard or computing the optimal recovery from an imperfect initial, uh, intermediate solution can be combinatorially hard. And so in, th in, in that sense, the expert is weak, right? The expert is some computational oracle in the structure prediction problem. And so here's uh, one completely different example of learning to search, um, which is learning to search in branch and bound algorithms. Uh, so this is used to solve uh, things like integer programs, right? So uh, integer programs are typically solved using a search heuristic known as branch and bound. And, in, and you see a depiction of this uh, in the bottom, where basically uh, you choose, at each part of the search, sp uh, search process, you choose an integer variable that you want to set, uh, and then you uh, 
and then you branch on that uh, setting that energy variable, in this case if it's binary, on either zero or one, right? And typically in branch about, there are two local decisions one make, a pruning and a, uh, excuse me, a ranking and a pruning. Ranking basically ranks all the energy variables to the ones that you want to, you want to set first, and pruning is eliminating energy variables uh, from consideration or settings of energy variables of consideration that you know cannot be optimal. And we'll, then the idea is to train a policy class that actually is a combination of two policy classes, one for ranking, one for pruning, and you could train using solved instances of integer programs such as those provided to us by an off-the-shelf solver such as Garubi. And the idea is to train this policy to solve these instances more efficiently or to generalize the new instances that you don't have uh, solutions for. And that leads me to talking about suboptimal experts, right? So here, the, the issue of having a suboptimal expert really comes into the foreground, right? Uh, if you have a really large integer program, you don't actually have, uh, you know, the optimal solution, the optimal uh, integer solution. You have a suboptimal solution. So how does one get around this? One is, well, if we have query access to the environment, such as what we typically do in, in reinforcement learning, we know the quality of a solution, right? We just, we just only have suboptimal demonstrations of finding suboptimal solutions. So by having query access to the environment and, in, and blending a little bit of very simple exploration, such as epsilon greedy, with various imitation learning algorithms, we can learn to uh, imitate, uh, we could use imitation learning to learn a policy that actually is better than what the teacher can provide us. We could do more sophisticated exploration which combines things like contextual bandits. And there are other approaches that take a more reinforcement learning centric uh, interpretation of this problem, such as taking an actor critic style approach to this structure prediction problem. And so let me just give you a, uh, just a, a small description of one such example which is called from the paper Learning to Search Better Than Your Teacher. Uh, by Chong et al. in uh, ICMO 2015. And here I have to introduce just a, a, a simple concept called a roll-in, which is a little bit different from a roll-out. In a roll-in, uh, you execute a policy without any considerations for learning. And then in a roll-out, which is what we talked about before, we execute some other policy and use the information from that roll-out for learning. So here, uh, it's again a sequential decision-making problem in the search space and we roll in from a policy until some time step, and then we, then we look at all possible one-step deviations of that, of that state that we end up in after roll in, and we, then we roll out using some other policy to collect reward. And so uh, what this paper analyzed was different combinations of roll in and roll out. And so if the expert that's providing us labels and, or trajectories in the search space is not optimal, then you actually want the roll in to be from your learned policy and your roll out to be from a mixture, from a mixture between the role, your learned policy and the expert policy. Now, uh, CERN, which is, what we, which is one of the methods we discussed in the first half, is uh, in the, um, the bottom left corner. And it is not optimal if the, if, the reference if the reference or the expert is not optimal. And so this is a generalization of CERN in some sense that can uh, learn to do better than the expert. Okay, uh, another issue uh, that is, um, you can think of as a special case of structure prediction is time series modeling, such as time series forecasting, right? So I have here um, a very simple equation of a time series model uh, where the next state, x t sub one, t plus one, excuse me, is uh, equal to some dynamics model f applied to the previous state x sub t. If this dynamics model is stochastic, then we, in this case, we take the expectation. It's the expected next state. And so to do forecasting, the goal then is to learn a policy pi that maps x sub t to x sub t plus one, right? So in, in, in a sense, the input is the previous predict, the input to the policy is the, is the policy's own previous prediction. And so this is a special case of sequence prediction uh, because the input is fully determined by the previous prediction. Okay. Um, so again, we apply interactive imitation learning. So if the red line is the, is the ground truth of the time series model, of the time series data, excuse me, and the, and the gray line is the prediction of a policy that you know, is making mistakes, then we provide, interactively provide uh, feedback saying at this particular state, we, you should be predicting uh, that uh, something that's actually on the ground truth 
trajectory in this time series model. So this is an instance of interactive imitation learning where the expert policy is basically uh, arises from the data itself. And one can also extend to latent variable models. This is a fully observed uh, dynamical system. One could also extend this to latent variable dynamical system models as well. Okay, so uh, just to summarize, uh, what I presented to you uh, in this uh, part is applying imitation learning to structure prediction problems. And the key idea is that we want to learn the decision function or the inference function to navigate some search space. Um, this reduces to interactive imitation learning where the, we get expert feedback for some computation oracle derived from the supervised structure prediction problem when the supervised structure prediction labels. Uh, in some cases, this requires a careful choice of the loss function because the overall reward or cost function in the structure prediction task, it can be highly non-additive. And so you need to uh, do some careful design of the supervised reduction in order to lift guarantees from the supervised learning problem back into the original problem. And in many cases, because the search space can be combinatorially large, you have experts that are suboptimal, right? Because since the experts are derived from computational oracles at training time, if they're suboptimal, then we need to have ways of actually learning policies that perform better than the reference expert. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Huang to talk about a number of other applications. Hi everyone again. Uh, so for my part, I want to uh, switch gear a bit and discuss uh, a number of topics and papers that don't necessarily fit in neatly into the, the, the class of techniques that we have discussed so far. And mainly I'm gonna try to discuss extension and recent applications of either imitation learning or, or inverse reinforcement learning. And I will group recent work into a few topics and given the time, I. We have way more papers than, than we would like to, uh, uh, to have time to cover, so it's hard to do justice to all of them. But uh, I'm gonna try to group them into some uh, somewhat coherent manner. So first, we've been talking about imitation accuracy as a key optimization objective, but there are settings where imitation accuracy alone is not sufficient. Uh, and here is a concrete example of what I, what I meant. This is an application of our smooth imitation learning work from ICML uh, 2016. On the left, uh, you have a human uh, actually filming an event, in, in this case a sport event, and the goal is to have an autonomous camera. Uh, as you can see on the right, uh, learning from this, this type of demonstrations to be able to film event uh, autonom uh, autonomously in a human-like manner. So that's the goal. So what's the, uh, what's the learning problem here? Uh, first, we can extract certain contextual feature from the scene, like noisy detections of, uh, of objects, such as uh, humans in the scenes, et cetera. And the state will be composed of recent contexts and actions, where actions here is, a, is the angle that the camera is, is pointing to uh, effectively. And the expert actions in a, is a camera angle of the actual human filming the event. And now, the goal is we want to learn, the imitation uh, learning problem is we want to learn a policy that sequentially uh, map the state feature uh, to the right camera angle, right? So now, if we just use behavior cloning to imitate the expert, we see from the, from the plot of the test time uh, uh, actions that the imitation accuracy actually on average is quite good. But this is nowhere near being acceptable uh, or for our purpose because the sequence of action is extremely noisy. And the issue here is that we actually need both uh, imitation accuracy and actions being smooth. Um, and the reason behavior cloning is not smooth is because the function class that we consider here uh, to learn the policy is highly expressive. Typically we use some black box method like neural net or decision trees, and in trying to maximize the accuracy, it actually reacts to all the small changes in the state feature. Okay, so in uh, our paper, we propose a way to achieve smoothness by essentially uh, functional regular, uh, regularizing uh, function classes. Essentially regularize a complex policy class F, uh, such as neural net, with a smooth and simple model class G, uh, like a linear model. 
And similar to standard regularization, we can think of this new policy class, Pi, as trying to output uh, an action that is close to both F and G, where closeness is controlled by a regularizing parameters, lambda, uh, similar to standard regularization. And then we learn this regularized policy in an iterative loop uh, in a fashion actually similar to uh, Dagger or CERN that we discussed before. Uh, one big difference is that uh, we develop a way to actually use simulated expert feedback so that we don't need interactive uh, expert guiding the algorithm. And in each loop, we execute the current policy, and then using this trace and the expert feedback, we re-estimate the parameters of the regularizer G, and then we uh, update the parameters of the complex function F. Uh, we then combine F and G to form an, an updated policy uh, we call it pi hat, which will then be interpolated with the old policy to form a new policy uh, in a fashion similar to Dagger, uh, to, um, uh, excuse me, to CERN. Uh, and so in our paper, we proved that the algorithms actually achieve uh, monotonic policy improvement and the learning rates can be uh, set adaptively for faster conversions uh, compared to standard imitation learning algorithms. After a few iterations, the algorithm is able to uh, quickly learn something as that strike a balance between uh, uh, accuracy and smoothness. Along the theme of regularizing function, uh, function classes, there is also a recent work uh, presenting at this conference by Verma et al. where the authors propose a method to imitate a black box policy trained by reinforcement learning and regularize the imita uh, by imitating, uh, by the imitation by a symbolic program. The result is an interpretable policy on top of a uh, good imitation uh, performance. Uh, for example, one can uh, be viewed as a series of if then else statement which can be used to verify and guarantee uh, correctness of the policy. And quickly, what if we want to have safe training and good imitations together? This is one goal of a paper title, Query uh, Efficient Imitation Learning for End-to-End -end Autonomous Driving by Zhang and uh, Cho in uh, 2017. The task is to imitate an expert in the torque uh, driving simulation environment to learn a driving policy which maps the images from the front camera to the steering angle. And similar to Dagger, we have an expert policy pi star that's guiding the process. The key issue, excuse me, the key issue here is that uh, there are instances uh, during training that executing the learning policy will result in unsafe behavior. For example, the car may veer off the road or crashing into a nearby vehicle. So the idea to fix this is to train a separate classifier, C safe, which outputs uh, at each frame. Uh, how likely the current policy is going to deviate from the expert by some threshold amount epsilon. And CSAFE is trained by collecting sample from CSAFE uh, star, which, is simply, uh, which simply indicates uh, whether the current policy pi and pi star would differ by epsilon, which we can do during training. And then we can use binary cross uh, entropy loss as the objective to train CSAFE. And then the way to incorporate safety into training is then pretty straightforward. Uh, the principle is in current state, if, uh, if C safe returns one, then we drive using uh, our current policy pi. Otherwise, the, the, the expert policy pi star will take over and the policy, current policy is considered unsafe. And uh, so basically the, the, the authors propose an algorithm uh, called safe dagger based on this principle. And the key difference between safe dagger and the original dagger is that we, uh, we use a safety classifier to decide uh, whether state are unsafe, and then we only query experts at those unsafe states. So we can think of this uh, as an active version of dagger. The result is that safe dagger is able to learn a policy uh, using uh, less number of queries compared to the original dagger and also the number of damages uh, during training is also much lower compared to behavior cloning uh, and dagger, compared to uh, both behavior cloning and dagger. Okay, so next we're going to talk about uh, multitask, uh, transfer and meta imitation learning. First consider this 
block stacking uh, task where we want to stack six blocks into uh, three towers with this particular color ordering. Uh, ordering. But the initial condition uh, and location of three towers may differ from one trial to the next. So we consider this to be the same task, and these are three different instances of the same task. And now, what happens if we also want to uh, handle similar tasks, but we want to stack one tower of height six instead of three towers of height two, or uh, one tower of four and then the other one of two, et cetera. So the traditional uh, learning approach is to collect many demonstrations from each task and then train a policy for each one of them separately. And in the case where we have multiple related tasks, however, the question is, can we come up with a way to, uh, to do this more efficiently? And the idea of one-shot imitation learning by uh, Duan and all in, uh, in uh, 2017 is to pull together a distribution of tasks and then train a neural network policy so that at test time, the neural network policy can generalize from a single demonstration of a previously unseen task. So um, the way uh, that uh, training uh, takes place is we assume during training we have uh, multiple pairs of demonstrations from expert of two different instances of the same task. And the idea is we are going to treat this, uh, the second demonstrations uh, showing here on the right essentially as a validation trajectory. And the neural network being trained will take as input the first trajectory which is from a different instance, and the current state of the second trajectory. And the neural net will try to output the corresponding expert actions of the second trajectory, which we do know uh, during training. And at test time, the desired execution is uh, very similar, except that now we only have one demonstration of the new task. And facing a different instance of the same task, we simply uh, roll out the policy that we learned. A uh, related work by Tobin et al. in 2017 takes this one step further and attempts to handle the situations when training can be done purely in simulation uh, through virtual reality and testing is done in the real world. So to handle this uh, sim to real transfer, they uh, train uh, using domain uh, randomizations uh, with uh, different lighting conditions and different surface uh, texture, et cetera. And the result is something like this, where the network will map visual images uh, to actions uh, end to end. And also the human can give demonstrations uh, only in, uh, simply in virtual reality, uh, like in the upper left-hand corner, uh, instead of uh, previously having to uh, grab the robotic arms to uh, literally demonstrate the task. Uh, perhaps the algorithmic framework can be made clearer by viewing one-shot imitation learning through the meta-learning uh, lens. And the key idea uh, from uh, two papers by Finn et al. in 2017 is to view multiple policy for related tasks as sharing a common initialization parameters data, which is the policy parameters that we are going to find. And the goal is to find theta so that when we find a new task i, uh, given a limited number of demonstrations for task i, a task-specific policy uh, now parameterized by theta i can be quickly obtained uh, from theta by a few or ideally uh, one gradient step on a task-specific loss, uh, li. And uh, during training, we, uh, similar to before, we're gonna take a pair of demonstration uh, of the same task and alternatingly use gradient descent to first uh, simulate, the, simulate the fast adaptations update rule uh, from theta to theta i using the second rules here, and then use that new theta i. In turn, we're gonna turn around, use a theta i to go back and perform gradient descent on the meta objective. There's also a recent extension of this meta learning approach to the setting where instead of having human tele-operating the robots to give demonstrations, 
the robot uh, propose uh, the authors propose to do one shot imitation learning uh, in the transfer context where the human give demonstration in natural state uh, and the robot has to learn the task uh, via mapping uh, the video of human performing the task to the right joint action. So this is a group of papers uh, that handle one-shot imitation learning in uh, various different settings. And before moving on, I want to uh, touch on a paper from NIPS 2017 from Amin et al. in the inverse reinforcement learning setting. And so in this case, say we have an unknown reward function theta star, and we talked about before in the first half of the tutorial uncovering theta star from single task inverse reinforcement learning is not a well-posed problem, right? But the setting undressed in this paper is a little bit different in that what if we have multiple tasks corresponding to multiple environments which may have different dynamics? As the, the motivation is, um, you know, this common parameters theta star may uh, represent something about the latent human preference in terms of how human wants to communicate to the robot. So then the goal for us is to learn theta star from demonstration from as few tasks as possible and generalize to a new one. And the authors consider two different settings where um, the, the authors consider two different settings where the agent can choose to, to, uh, to, can choose to, to learn the task actively, which is an easier setting or the more difficult setting is that nature can reveal the task adversarially. So this is the, the problem uh, that the paper discuss. So next, uh, I'm just going to uh, discuss another imitation learning settings where we may have multiple agents interacting in the environment or the behavior may exhibit multiple different modalities that doesn't quite fit into the traditional imitation learning setting. Uh, let's first consider imitation learning problem here where we have multiple agents coordinating to achieve uh, a common goal. Um, let's see if the video will play. Oh, it does. Uh, an example is a predator-prey game with four predators uh, trying to uh, corner a, com a, co a common uh, prey. And perhaps a more interesting example here we're going to focus on is learning multiple policies from uh, tracking data of real-life uh, professional football. So the data here is from the Premier League in England. Uh, we have the red team attacking from left to right. The blue dots are the actual defending team. Uh, and the white dots are the test time uh, policy learned using the method proposed in our paper uh, called Coordinated Multi-Agent Imitation Learning from ICML 2017. So the, the biggest problem when we want to adapt imitation learning to coordinated setting is that uh, the expert demonstration often contain raw information that is implicit and we don't get to observe. For example, the notions, uh, take the example of football, the notion of defensive midfielder, uh, in a way, if you think about it, is a poorly defined notion, right? And also, a coordinating agent may switch or swap raw during the same, uh, during the same trajectory. So if we want to lift imitation learning from single agent to multi-agent setting, one of the properties that we usually take for granted during uh, black, using black box methods is somehow the neural net or decision tree uh, will be able to take a state representations that already has a right ordering, right? And this is fine if we fit into a, uh, say a vector of words uh, embedding or etc. But in the multi-agent context, the issue is that uh, we don't really have uh, a natural way to have semantically consistent input representation. For example, the feature vector of agent acting in row one, for example, should come into the first slot and the second row should correspond to the second slot, etc. And this is the kind of ideal scenario that we want. However, in reality, if we don't have this raw information, uh, what we actually have, what we are facing, is all sort of permutation of the demonstration data that may make the learning process very, uh, very noisy. So we don't, we don't really have access to the latent raw information, and what can we do in this case? And the idea, uh, the, pro uh, the proposed method that uh, in this paper is to combine imitation learning with unsupervised graphical model of uh, inference and learning. The graphical model encodes the latent raw information uh, 
uh, where we optimize the policy and learn the graphical model in an alternating fashion. So uh, in particular, for each uh, iterations, uh, if we fix the graphical model parameters, then we can solve a small uh, combinatorial optimization problems to assign the right index to each agent. And then, uh, and then we can use any imitation learning algorithms condition on this indexing uh, to update the policy for each agent. We then execute this policy and we use stochastic variational inference to jointly fine tune the graphical models parameters again. And each optimization step uh, is, uh, is done in a, in, in a loop and it can be done in a mini batch in a, to, to speed up training. And uh, just so you can visualize in uh, the, the football applications, this is what the latent information would encode. So basically we learn in an unsupervised manner that the average formation from the British Premier League is roughly correspond to the 442 formation. Okay, so here I just wanna show an example of what happened if we ignore this implicit coordination during training. You can see on the left hand side that uh, the, the joint actions become severely uncoordinated and basically um, the imitation learning problem essentially collapse. A quick mention of a recent work by Zan et al. dealing with multi-agent imitation learning setting, but now they're trying to learn a, uh, they're trying to learn a generative model instead of just learning to mimic uh, agents. Uh, to, 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 I'm sorry, to mimic the experts. And to learn a model for generative imitation learning, so typically the agent has to infer high level uh, intent that uh, dictate low level actions, right? And this high level information is also frequently a latent variable. So I want to illustrate this point via an extension of generative adversarial imitation learning. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you could see the video very clearly, but uh, here we have, uh, we, we have the Torx uh, driving simulation again, and the driving demonstration in this case will consist of two different modes, uh, either passing on the left or passing on the right. And we can view this decision of passing on left versus right as a latent variable, Z, that once condition on this variable being zero or one, uh, the resulting behavior of the same policy will kind of branch out differently. So one reason that original Gale approach doesn't work too well in this type of uh, problem is that vanilla generative adversarial networks tend to have trouble telling apart different modality from the data. And so instead, the suggested method here is to augment uh, the original Gale objective with additional regularization by trying to essentially maximize the mutual information between the latent variable Z on one hand and the state action pair uh, that is generated by the policy on the other hand. Uh, and this um, mutual information quantity, even though is uh, intractable, it can be approximated by some uh, variational lower bound. And so the GAN training objective is uh, additionally replaced by Wasserstein GAN to uh, remedy the mode collapsing problem that I refer uh, a minute ago. Uh, another improvement from, uh, improvement from original Gale uh, is that the policy now can take high dimensional visual input data so uh, to summarize the result, you can see here that the policy uh, being learned was able to differentiate distinctly between the two mode of passing on the left versus passing on the right. And one side benefit of uh, learning the latent variable to go back to the subject of ge generative um, imitation learning is that now we can use this to generate different uh, type of behavior, uh, which is not seen during training. In particular, uh, if uh, we use uh, z equal to 0.5, uh, the ensuing behavior will be something that interpolate between z equal to zero and z equal to one. So uh, I move on to some other topics, but if interested, you can also uh, see other recent paper related to this, uh, to this theme here. Now I'll discuss some recent work on the subject of uh, inverse uh, reinforcement teaching, in quotes, uh, and the reason uh, is that uh, this is not really a term, this is something that I, that I made up to capture the theme of the subsequent papers that trying to uh, figure out the right way for human to teach machine. 
uh, or to communicate the reward function to the machine, which is related to the inverse reinforcement learning problem that we talked about in the first half. Okay, so we already talked about how learning a reward function from human uh, demonstration is a useful way to learn behavior instead of manually specifying the reward function, right? Now, the question of interest here is, how should human demonstrate the task? And usually in inverse reinforcement learning, as we touched on before, the assumption is the expert demonstration should correspond to uh, an optimal policy or a near optimal policy. And the robot, as a passive observer, would learn the implied reward function from this human's optimal trajectories. However, one subtle problem that may arise is that by efficiently demonstrating the task, human actually may ignore useful teaching behavior. So, for instance, uh, think of this uh, example of the cooking robot. Instead of just showing the optimal path how to, how to make pasta, a uh, human may be better off explaining the steps in cooking or showing the robot what to do when, uh, the uh, when we run out of ingredients, for example, uh, etc. So the question here is, which path should the human take to actually teach the reward function to the robot? And from this starting point, uh, the authors of this paper, Cooperative Inverse Reinforcement Learning, formulate the problem as a uh, two players game where the human and robot may take turn demonstrating the task and estimating the reward function. And it's an asymmetric game in the sense that the human has access to the, to the true human reward function, but the robot only knows a prior distribution over the human rewards. Um, and actually, this is the key to make the learning problem uh, is uh, tractable than a general, uh, general uh, Markov game. And under the assumption in this particular, particular paper, under the assumption of linear reward function, the authors show that when demonstrating the behavior to the robot, humans actually should take into account the robot's posterior inference of the reward into showing the demonstrations. And under certain settings, the interesting conclusion is that this amounts to a different optimization objective than simply maximizing the human reward. I just quickly note here that an extension of this work is also presented uh, uh, this year here as ICML. A related paper from Ho et al. in NIP16 also take a Bayesian perspective to learning and teaching and arrive at a similar message uh, which is that an expert who is motivated to teach uh, will or should take into account uh, the learner's inference about what's optimal, uh, which is called uh, demonstrations or doing here. And so in this work, one interesting aspect of uh, extra uh, aspect of this work compared to the previous one is that the authors conduct experiment using humans to confirm this hypothesis where depending on whether the instruction is to do the task or to show someone how to do the task will result in different setup behavior as you can see in two different setup trajectories here. Okay, so um, up until this point, uh, the feedback that we assume from the expert usually takes the form of optimal or near optimal actions. And as we try to teach machines to do useful things, there are other type of feedback that makes sense for human expert. Um, and we're gonna, in this last topic, we're gonna focus on a few alternative of uh, expert feedback. So starting with a paper that we are going to present uh, in this conference um, in a few days, the central question that we study here is that how can we most efficiently make use of expert feedback? And the starting observation is that very often, human give feedback with a natural hierarchical structure assumed. For instance, if someone asks you how to navigate to the restroom, most likely you'll give instruction based on certain signposts, like going to the end of the hall, make a left uh, until the corridor and make, uh, make another left, etc. And this is pretty much in contrast with a typical flat reinforcement learning or imitation learning setting where planning is supposed to happen step by step. So to is illustrate this point further, consider this navigation scenario where the agent represented by uh, a white dot in the uh, bottom left corner uh, has to find its way to the yellow block. 
and say the agent is making his way and stumble around and then get stuck in one of the room, then flat imitation learning algorithm will require that the expert provide corrections for individual mistakes along the way. And so the effort required from the expert would essentially be proportional to the task horizon, right? And the question here is, can we do better than this? And given a hierarchical structure, we indeed can do better. Uh, in this case, we would want to uh, have a uh, high-level policy that decide which, uh, which macro actions that we're going to take. For example, a macro actions in this case would correspond to go to one of the exit door given the room that you're in. And in this paper, we propose a type of expert feedback that, require, uh, that uh, essentially requires much less effort from the teacher. For instance, after the, the agents pick some macro actions, the low-level policy would execute the, the low-level actions. And, uh, and when, when uh, upon completions, we only ask a teacher to verify whether the macro action has been completed successfully or not, basically an up vote or a down vote. So the idea is to ask for, for, for feedback that is much weaker than, is, uh, than, than providing the full low-level details. And the key insight here is that verifying in, in this manner is actually much cheaper than labeling the micro actions. And the second key insight of our algorithm is uh, that the experts should mostly provide high level feedback and only zoom into low level when necessary. And intuitively, when the agent has pick a good subtask, uh, uh, but not being able to, to, to complete it. That's the only instance where the expert or the, uh, uh, the expert should really micromanage in this case. And we show that these uh, ideas allow significant saving in terms of teacher's effort as measured by the amount of feedback provided. And we also extend our approach to hierarchically compose imitation learning at the top level and reinforcement learning at the low level and apply it to the challenging uh, Atari game Montezuma's Revenge. And we show that using only a modest amount of expert feedback, the algorithm can still learn significantly faster than using pure reinforcement learning. Another example of learning from weak feedback is uh, the work on learning from human preferences from Cristiano et al. in NIPS 17. And again, here we want to teach useful behavior to uh, the learning agent without requiring so much effort from the human teachers. The method here in particular um, infers a reward function uh, from human evaluative uh, judgment by uh, showing the human evaluator two different set of trajectories and asking the human to provide pairwise comparison instead of numeric uh, feedback. And in many cases, this preference feedback, as you can imagine, is much easier to specify than strictly numeric uh, reward uh, that we see either uh, in, in standard reinforcement learning setting. Um, as, uh, uh, and uh, the, the unknown reward, so the particular method that the, the authors uh, propose in this case, the unknown reward function R is viewed as a latent factor explaining human judgment. And the hypothesis uh, coming from uh, Bradley Terry's model is that humans' probability of preferring a trajectory tau 1 over tau 2 depend exponentially on the value of latent rewards summing over the length of the trajectories. And from here, we can estimate the reward function, the latent reward function, by minimizing the cross entropy between these predictions and the actual human judgment collected from the data. And the takeaway of the result is that uh, using this technique, uh, we are able to learn a good reward function using not so many uh, human label. You can also check out some previous work using this type of preference feedback from uh, previous uh, conferences. And last, on the subject of natural feedback, I like to talk about Coach, an algorithm from a paper called Interactive Learning from Policy-Dependent Human Feedback by Mark Glashens et al. from last year's ICML. The motivation here is to teach robots to do tasks, uh, taking inspiration from animal training. And uh, to start with, the author run an experiment with human subjects 
And here's an example of the interface on uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, where the dog is supposed to uh, go to the goal in yellow without crossing the lawn. And humans can give uh, discrete rewards or uh, punishment. And turns out, the empirical result is that human feedback tends to be policy dependent. Uh, in particular, what that means is that human feedback may be differential, meaning that positive feedback is more frequent when the dog uh, is improving from uh, bad dog to good dog instead of uh, uh, from okay to good. Or human feedback can also exhibit diminishing return property, meaning that as the agent adopts good behavior, uh, positive feedback may become less frequent. And this is quite different from what we saw from other imitation learning uh, scheme uh, previously discussed, where humans su is, uh, is supposed to give optimal feedback consistently, right? So from this empirical result, the author note that the advantage function in reinforcement learning is a good feedback model in that it fits these criteria. Um, and in case you're not familiar with uh, advantage functions, it simply is the difference between action value function Q uh, and state value function V. Um, which basically show how good taking an action A is compared to the expected value. And now the strategy of coach is to have humans supplying the rewards and to teach uh, and to, to treat human feedback as an approximation to the advantage function. So from this starting observation, the idea is to start with the policy gradient theorem. Uh, with, uh, which we saw from the first half of the, of the tutorial. And now to update the policy parameters theta, we will use gradient descent as usual, except that the advantage function is replaced by some discretized human reward or punishment. And the assumption here is that those discretized human rewards, uh, which uh, obviously are much more natural for human to supply than numeric values, will be uh, equal to the actual advantage function in expectation. So here's one uh, experiment using coach. Uh, just to uh, describe to you the setting, the human is trying to train a robot, in this case the turtle bot, to hide away from the, from the ping ball. And human is giving discrete feedback, which is either this uh, red uh, circle or the uh, or the blue, uh, blue square using a Wii controller. So it's discretized, I, I believe it's a binary feedback. And so, for example, punishment is given when the robot moves toward the ball, and reward is given when the robot uh, does correct behavior, for example, move away from the ball or turn away when the, the ball is sufficiently far, and et cetera. And here is a short clip of the result. After this very short training period, the turtle bot has learned the correct responses to all the stimulus, and we can test it by putting the ball directly in front of it, which causes it to move away, turn when it's far enough away, and then stop when the ball is out of its vision. Um, you can check out more complicated experiment in the paper. And I just want to point out that a, 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 a paper that is a predecessor of Coach called Tamer, which it was a related ideas using human feedback to directly learn a policy uh, to overcome credit assignments uh, of reinforcement, uh, credit assignment problem of reinforcement learning, if you're interested. Um, so uh, with that, I would like to uh, summarize. And so far, hopefully, uh, you have seen from this tutorial that imitation learning is a broad research area with many uh, interesting research questions. And although we didn't really have time to compare directly against reinforcement learning, it's been our experience that imitation learning is a much more uh, practical approach compared uh, to reinforcement learning, to pure reinforcement learning, uh, when it comes to cer certain criteria such as sample complexity, cost of doing experiment, or the requirement of having a simulator, etc. And as you have seen from Yi Song's description and myself, imitation learning has found a diverse range of applications um, well beyond. Uh, uh, video games or other simulated environment. And with that, I'm going to end here and we are happy to answer any remaining questions that you may have. Sorry for going a little over time. Uh, if you need to leave, of course, please feel free. But if you have questions, we're happy to stick around for a little while to answer them.